Well, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here today. I want to thank the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts for hosting this presentation and um, MRC and all the help uh, that I've received from everyone. Um, I'm a practicing neuropsychologist. Um, I've been around for a long time. <laughs> um, and uh, I began my career, uh, interestingly, as a substance abuse counselor, substance use disorders at, the, at that time. Um, the treatment methods and so on were pretty crude compared to what's going on right now. Um, but that's how I began my career. And in the process of um, seeing clients uh, that had uh, substance use disorders, uh, I recognized that a certain percentage of these people had histories of brain injury, uh, which in those days wasn't identified at all, uh, other than to say the person might mention it in a counseling session, that they had a few experiences where they've fallen off a bar stool or, or been in a fight or whatever and been knocked unconscious. Oftentimes, taking a history, you know, ask the patient, have you ever had uh, an injury to your brain? And uh, they'll say, absolutely not. Uh, then I'll ask them if they've ever been knocked out in a fight. And they'll say, oh, yeah, many times, you know, so... It's obviously that they don't know the difference. And, um, uh, but in my work uh, in, the, in the substance use field, um, I began noticing two issues, one being the history of, of, of head injury, which was pretty significant, and also the present, presence of cognitive deficits, which may or may not have been related to head injury, but may have been primarily related to substance use itself. Um, so... As I did this work, I decided to go back to school and uh, get my doctoral degree in neuropsychology uh, with an emphasis on the neuropsychological aspects of substance use disorder. Um, and then I did my training, my clinical training in Boston, but then um, uh, did a fellowship at Brown University for two years where I worked primarily in the neurosurgery unit where most of the patients that came in were traumatic brain injury cases. Um, and uh, I kept track of those, and over the course of a year, 70% of the patients that came in for traumatic brain injury to the neurosurgery unit had some substance on board at the time of the injury, mostly alcohol, but other substances were present as well. So those experiences led me to uh, open up my practice to seeing people that had this sort of combined problem of substance use disorder and traumatic brain injury. And um, so I began doing this very... Uh, at a very early stage in my career, uh, in the 1980s, um, where I began seeing uh, patients uh, with this combined problem. And um, over the course of those experiences, I um, tried to weave in what has to be done, what are the unique characteristics of this group, and I'm going to go through some of those unique characteristics as we go through the presentation today. Um, and... Um, Another area that's related to this that I've had a lot of experience in is the assessment and treatment of patients with chronic pain and addiction. Um, uh, lo and behold, uh, what we find is that somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of patients that have had chronic pain um, and have remained inactive because of that pain will also show up with cognitive impairments on neuropsychological testing. And a certain percentage of those patients have histories of head injury. Uh, so there's this complex group of patients uh, that have a combination of chronic pain, um, traumatic brain injury, and um, addiction, typically addiction to, to uh, pain medications. Um, and um, it's a very fascinating group to work with. And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about the group process, uh, the bulk of the treatment for patients with with uh, combined pain, head injury, and, and uh, addiction uh, was through a group process. And the group process was very, very effective and, uh, and very helpful. Okay, next slide. So traumatic brain injury is the most common of serious disabling neurological disorders. It's a significant problem in all societies. In the United States, at least 1.4 million traumatic brain injuries occur every year, and there are 5.3 million people living with disability from traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is largely a disorder for young, uh, of younger people, and then there's another group of older people. Um, these two 
uh, groups make it makes sense. The younger people are taking more risks, and the older people are falling down a lot. So, especially in the winter months, uh, people slipping on the ice and so on. Individuals younger than 30, mostly males, make up the largest proportion of those affected. Uh, people older than 60 also make up a sizable proportion of the traumatic brain injury population. Next slide. Next slide. Yep, thank you. Uh, older people uh, present particular problems related to aging, including comorbidities, slower and less complete recovery, and vulnerability to complications of injury and treatment. Uh, TBI commonly affects people with pre-existing problems, such as substance use disorders, psychiatric disorders, learning disabilities, ADHD, and behavioral disorders. The most important and consistent effects of traumatic brain injury involve cognitive, emotional, and behavioral function. So once the physicians have done their job and, and uh, saved the person's life and got the person in a position to re-enter the community, uh, the the next stage, really, which is the, I think, incredibly crucial stage is trying to transition the person uh, into uh, independence. Um, and there are many barriers to that, including uh, the use of substances being a major barrier. Um, motor and sensory perceptual problems also occur in varying amounts, uh, more likely in those uh, with more severe injuries. Um, Okay, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Cognitive and behavioral problems uh, present more challenges to the healthcare system because they are often more difficult to recognize, uh, characterize, and treat um, than traditional medical and physical problems. Persons with traumatic brain injury, particularly less severe injuries, may not have any obvious physical markers of the injury, though there, are, uh, there may be profound effects in the, uh, on the individual's ability to function largely resulting from cognitive and behavioral dysfunction. TBI, especially more, more serious or severe injuries, can have a relatively extended natural history and lifelong effects. Um, I had an experience where I was driving back from New York City, and uh, this is pre-COVID, and I was driving back and I looked up at a, at a poster that was uh, a billboard that was on the side of the road in it and on the top of the billboard it said which one of these people and there was a uh, like four people sort of standing in a circle having a conversation and the and the billboard said which one of these people has a traumatic brain injury and of course you couldn't tell by looking at them right traumatic brain injury those people that Many people who have traumatic brain injury have no visible signs of it and what they what they what they have instead is compromised function in general. Things just don't feel right to the patient. My practice, now that I'm no longer working, at, I'm no longer hospital-based, in my practice, the vast majority of patients who come in for evaluation have a history of mild traumatic brain injury. And, and there's a whole range of cognitive impairments associated with mild brain injury. Now, some patients will come in, for example, and neuropsychological testing will show nothing. It will show normal results, yet the patient's complaining. Is it possible that the patient could have a, neuro, uh, have a normal neuropsychological evaluation? Yes. And still, and still have impairment. Uh, neuropsychological testing sometimes is just not challenging enough for some, for some patients. Um, so uh, let me give you a quick clinical example, if, if you don't mind. I, I had a patient just recently who came to me. He is um, a, a person that had a um, alcohol dependency uh, plus uh, seven um, concussions in the last 10 years. And um, uh, when he came to me, this is an individual who's quite bright and has an IQ of about 125, a very smart guy. And the uh, Neuropsychological evaluation, standard neuropsychological evaluation was completely normal. He was evaluated uh, by a, a neuropsychology group in Providence, um, told he was um, normal and there's nothing wrong. Um, he didn't believe there was nothing wrong because he felt different. He didn't feel like himself. So when um, he came to see me for a second opinion, I did what's called challenge testing. So I gave him tests that were much more challenging than standard neuropsychological tests. And, of course, he failed those tests. 
while at the same time, all of the usual neuropsychological tests were normal. So this is a person who you might say, well, what, you know, when is normal not normal? Well, you have to, you have to actually uh, go beyond sometimes what the, the tests are that we're taught as neuropsychologists. Next slide. So TBI is a, daughter, a, a disorder of a wide variety of pathophysiological effects, a range of severities, and a multitude of problems that may occur as a result of the injury. Now, persons with apparently similar injuries may have significant variation in their presentation, course of recovery, response to interventions, and ability to return to function. Next slide. Mental illnesses, nervous system diseases, brain tumors, head trauma are the first things that come to mind when most people consider pathological conditions of the human brain. But in reality, substance use disorder and addiction are more prevalent than other brain diseases and have a much greater impact on the fabric of our society. You have to think, not everybody thinks this way. When I started in the substance use field, um, the predominant model, obviously, being the disease model, but 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 beyond that, uh, n people didn't really think about the brain much. They just thought that, well, uh, all you had to do was stop using and everything would be fine. But the reality is that um, that is not always the case. In fact, most of the time it's not the case. Um, so we need to be looking at substance use as, in fact, a brain disorder, and the more recent um, definition of, a, of addiction um, basically states that addiction is a brain disorder. Uh, no one would abuse substances if it didn't affect your brain. I mean, you, it would be, it would just wouldn't happen, right? So nobody's going to snort antibiotics, right? It's not, it's not going to have any impact on your brain. So we, we do we take substances to alter our consciousness to change something, either to, to experience euphoria or to escape some sort of psychic pain. But nonetheless, we are affecting our nervous system, our neurotransmitters, and so on. Among people ages 19 to 54, um, the one-year prevalence rate of anxiety disorder is 18%, mood disorder is 9%, schizophrenia 1%, and any medical dis med mental disorder at all is 26%. So in combining the complexity of substance use, central nervous system function, traumatic brain injury, there's, al there's also issues that we have to contend with that have to do with mental illness. Um, and uh, many people just just on the basis of the changes that have occurred in their life and the trauma that they've experienced, will often have other mood, other disorders, especially mood disorders and, and anxiety as well. Next slide. This compares with illicit drug use of 8.7% of the U.S. population 12 years uh, and up uh, in the past month. Underage alcohol use uh, ranged from a low of 17% in Utah to a high of 40% in North Dakota. Nicotine addiction, 29% of the population over 12, and gambling addiction and affects 2% to 6% of adults. And what you're going to hear from me in a few minutes is just exactly what's going on in a person who has an addiction, even a gambling addiction. What's going on in their brain? Something funny is going on in that brain that keeps that compulsion going. Right. Next slide. Substance use disorder may also be the number one continuing public health problem in the U.S. More than 443,000 Americans die prematurely every year due to nicotine addiction, and another 53,000 die from secondhand smoke. Another 80,000 die prematurely from substance use disorder, abuse, overdose, or associated diseases. Six to 10,000 die of cocaine, heroin, or methamphetamine overdose, or dependence. Each day, 1,740 Americans die from substance use dependence uh, disorder or related causes. It's more than one death every minute. It's amazing. It's amazing. This enormous problem we have in this culture, and if you take a look at funding for disorder, diseases and disorders, it's one of the lowest funded area, yet it's the most prominent problem. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I guess it's not, um, 
something that people like to talk about. Or, but the fact of the matter is we have, we have some people that really need help. And um, when you add in, you know, these other issues, I'll talk of, if, hopefully it's on one of the slides, but the, uh, the latest brain injury we're seeing is the opioid um, uh, survivors and then the people that have gone and had overdoses and then survived the overdose are turning up with pretty significant cognitive impairment. Uh, it seems to be more related to the fentanyl problem rather than the heroin problem. So if if if, if the patient is using, if the client's using uh, heroin that's that that also includes fentanyl, then they overdose. Uh, if, if they survive the overdose, there's a high probability that they'll end up with some significant cognitive impairment, primarily memory impairment. Next slide. The history of TBI, or other quiet brain disorder, uh, can result in either both focal lesions or diffuse lesioning. So if a person gets a traumatic brain injury, the, the first thing that's going to happen is the entire brain is going to shake because the brain doesn't sit tightly in your... In your um, cranial vault, it moves. So you have you have um, injuries from deceleration, injuries from acceleration. Uh, so you could have a generalized um, diffuse lesioning from traumatic brain injury, or you could have uh, a focal lesion, that is you're, you're hit with a blunt object on, on, the, on the side of the head, and, and as a result, there is a a hemorrhage that develops, uh, say, in the left parietal lobe or the right parietal lobe or the frontal lobe, wherever it might be. Uh, then there is the combination, uh, which is more common, which is if you're in a high-speed car accident and your head hits the windshield, uh, you're going to have um, deceleration, you're going to have diffuse injury, and you're probably going to have some focal lesioning um, in the white matter or in the frontal lobes. Usually subdural hematomas will occur. Some key structures pertaining to cognitive functions include white matter just below the cortex, um, the cortex itself, the basal ganglia, a very, very critical area uh, for movement, uh, fine motor movement, frontal systems. I say frontal systems rather than frontal lobes because the frontal lobes are intimately connected throughout the brain. Um, so even though an injury might occur in the frontal lobe, uh, it's affecting other structures as well. We know uh, alcohol, for example, has a tendency to create problems in the cerebellum um, um, and other components of the diencephalon. In traumatic brain injury, uh, the, the most amount of damage we see in, in general in traumatic brain injury tends to be in the frontal lobes. And if you take a look at the brain, what you'll find is that the frontal lobe is the largest part of the brain. So it's the part of the brain that's more likely to get injured in any kind of an inj any kind of an accident, any any anything that happens where there's either a person is in a fight or falls, typically fall forward and injure the front part of the brain. Very very critical part of the brain when we start talking about substance use disorder. The frontal lobe is what we rely on to create sobriety. You can't get sober. If you have a problem in your frontal lobes, and I should say, and not you can't, you, you can't get sober easily if you have frontal lobe impairment because the frontal lobe has a very, very important role to play, um, which is the response to the, to the need to stop using. And if the response, that is the, the setting of goals and all that, are affected by a weak frontal lobe, then, then the person relapses very easily. And we'll talk about we'll talk about the old brain and the new brain in just a moment. And that's where we're going to talk about that frontal lobe. So when the reason I think the topic that we're talking about today has has um, come to the consciousness of most people in the rehabilitation field is is because um, as substance use counselors. And a person that has a completely healthy brain, it's difficult in those people to help them get sober. Right? Think about how much greater the difficulty is when the frontal lobe is injured. It's even more difficult, right? Because what you're doing as a counselor is you're trying to create new 
connections that support sobriety. New connections in the brain don't occur after 12 visits. I mean, you have to, you have to repeat and repeat and repeat the same information over and over and over again. 90 meetings in 90 days. You have to keep repeating, right? That's the only way you can create new circuitry in your brain is by repetition. So the idea of short-term therapy makes no sense when you think about uh, central nervous system. Um, so um, add, the, add to that issue the complexity of somebody who's actually injured the frontal lobe, and, and uh, we're relying on that person to be able to use their frontal lobe to stop themselves from giving in to urges, or to make better plans, or to make uh, or to cope better. Right? That's, a, that's a big request um, and assumes that there's an assumption that's made when you make a request like that, that the frontal lobes are working normally. Well, well, if you've had a traumatic brain injury, they're probably not functioning normally. So our job becomes very difficult, uh, to say the least. Next slide, please. All right, this is a, just a I, I like to think in a certain way when I think about the brain. I, there's two or three different ways I think about how the brain is organized. Um, and uh, in this model, uh, you, can, you can look at brain organization in three different ways. Uh, you can look at it from the bottom up. So we we'll start with the, the brain stem. Um, and there are certain structures in the brain stem that are survival structures, right? So when you injure the brain stem... Typically, you don't survive, right? So the brainstem is very, very helpful, necessary, in order to uh, have normal blood pressure, to have normal heart rate, to have normal temperature, and so on. All of that's regulated in that brainstem. And then if you go up the brain a little bit into the midbrain area, you have very, very important structures in there, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, um, the amygdala, another very, very critical. And then, And then as you go further up, you have these sub- Cortical structures, uh, the basal ganglia, the anterior cingulate, these are very, very important. And then you have the cortex. So information comes in, right? All information that we process comes in through the nervous system, up through the brainstem, through the midbrain, and then into the cortex for processing. So that's one way to look at the organization of the brain. Another way is, okay... The posterior part of the brain, that is the part of the brain that's behind the frontal lobes, is the part of the brain that accepts the information. And the frontal lobes are the part of the brain that responds to the information. So you, so you have, you can, if you, for example, if a person has difficulty understanding language, that is a problem in the person's ability to, to um, understand new information, to accept the information. Uh, on the other hand, if a person can understand language but can't produce language, that has to be a problem of output, right? So that's a, that's a language disorder that's based upon a frontal lobe lesion. Um, and then the other way uh, to, to keep the brain organized in your mind is the, versus, the left versus the right. So we have the left side of the brain, which in 99% of human beings, the left side of the brain is responsible um, for language um, as its primary function, um, but also many, many other functions. Calculation, for example, knowing the difference between right and left, and there's a lot of different things that go on in the left side of the brain. Um, and then on the right side of the brain, uh, it's the right side is responsible in general for understanding of visual perceptual functions. That is, how do we view the world? How do we understand the relationship of objects in space? Um, in addition to that, the right side of the brain is very um, important in <clears throat> processing of, of music and artistic uh, things. If you want to take a look at big gross differences between left and right hemisphere, think of it this way. The left hemisphere, this is why, this is such a magnificent structure when it works together, when the left and the right are working together, the left side of the brain is very, very interested in analyzing details, and the right side of the brain is very, very interested in keeping the details organized. So when somebody gets a brain injury and suddenly becomes very disorganized, you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's the right side of the brain that's been involved. If, on the other hand, somebody is, has been is having uh, 
difficulty analyzing details, then you can bet that it's a, a left brain issue. Um, so uh, I present the slide to you just as a way of trying to understand how the brain is organized. Let's say you have a patient uh, who has a history of nonverbal learning disability. A nonverbal learning disability um, is a, I don't think it's uncommon, but it's uncommonly diagnosed, let's put it that way. So a child is, uh, you know, uh, going through school and has very good communication skills. Left brain is working great. But for some reason, uh, this child seems to have a lot of difficulty with spatial processing, seems to have a lot of difficulty organizing himself, and typically will get diagnosed with ADHD. Now, now let, let's take that child and make him 20 years old or 21 years old. And now he starts to use substances. He's, um, he's getting himself into trouble. And he ends up in a treatment facility for substance use. Right? He's got a, he's got, he was born with a weak right hemisphere. How does that affect the patient's behavior? Well, it affects the behavior in, in a very interesting way, is that the nonverbal aspects of communication will, be, will not be very well integrated. So this is a person who misunderstands people a lot, who doesn't read body language very well, doesn't read facial expressions well. Now think about that person in a group therapy situation. Is that person able to participate fully in the group therapy if the right side of their brain doesn't help them understand social interactions, body language, facial expressions. So understanding and knowing the health of a person's brain as they are entering a treatment process, very helpful in adjusting the treatment process itself. Okay, next slide. Uh, I threw this in just because I, I wanted to emphasize a point, that that is the teenage brain is not ready to manage your stock portfolio. Uh, the teenage brain is just not fully developed. And take a look at the, f the, the brain on the left. It's a five-year-old brain. You can see that there's immature fibers in the, in the frontal lobes. Those are in red. Uh, and then the child becomes 11 or 12, and you can see that it's getting more integrated, and it's starting, the brain's starting to mature. These are, the, these are frontal lobe functions. Um, um, or what we refer to in, with, when we're talking about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we're talking about executive functions. Very, very important. Executive functions are critical. Uh, I'll define that in just a second. And there's the teenage brain, and the teenager, you know, is say 17 or 18, and wow, they seem to be pretty smart. They know what they're doing. They seem to be okay, but they're really not ready uh, to do complex processing. Uh, they're not ready uh, to um, be able to uh, tolerate uh, complex social situations. And it just so happens to be the time when people start using substances. In our mid-teens, sometimes earlier, but if, on average, in the mid-teens, right at a critical time in frontal lobe development. Recent studies have shown that, for example, uh, Middle teenagers that use marijuana on a regular basis, as compared to middle teenagers who only use marijuana on an experimental basis um, infrequently. By the time they reached 30, the, the ones that had the, had tended to use marijuana daily had um, uh, lower incomes and lower status jobs compared to those people that uh, did not use a lot of marijuana as teenagers. There's some literature now that suggests that when you're using a lot of marijuana, or other drugs for that matter, during these critical years of frontal lobe development, that what ends up happening is that you slow the developmental process. And I bet many of you know uh, families in which their 30-year-old or 35-year-old is still at home and behaving like he was 20. You know, so. I think there's a lot to be said for for um, frontal lobe development and how critical it is, and prevention um, measures are obviously very important to keep teens away from these drugs. 
that are slowing down their development. I mean, what, what happens when a frontal lobe doesn't develop fully? That's usually the kid that's getting into all kinds of trouble because of impulsive behavior. Next slide. So the teenage brain is a whirlwind of change. So, you know, parents of teenagers sometimes wonder if aliens have taken over their child's brain, but the truth is that their behavior is more likely the result of sensitive neuroplastic period. Uh, the teenage brain undergoes disorganization and reorganization from the onset of puberty into the early 20s. So what's going on is there's two times in in the beginning of our lives, you know, all the way up to about 30 years old, there were two times when the brain prunes itself. Right? The first year, the first year of life, first two years of life, we're born with way more uh, cells than we need. And so the brain will start taking care of itself by getting rid of cells that are inefficient, or cells that aren't working properly, and gets rid of a lot of cells. And that's pruning. And this happens again when we're 12, 13, 14. There is a storm going on in, in, in your brain in which uh, cells are being discarded, but not just be discarded. They're being discarded and networks are being set up. Networks where one cell isn't relating to one cell. Five cells are relating to 300 cells and so on. So these networks are beginning to develop in our teenage years. Once those networks are fully developed, then we can have a family, have a job, have expertise in some area of wherever our career is. We can, we can um, carry on complex social relationships, all that, all dependent upon what goes on during those teenage years. And that, unfortunately, that happens to be a time when a lot of people uh, experiment with drugs and alcohol. Not only that, they drive fast. And so they're experimenting with drugs and alcohol and then getting into car crashes at 16, 17, 18 years of age. Okay, the discovery of um, reorganization of the adolescent brain supports the notion that natural developmental milestones and life challenges coincide with sensitive periods of neural development and enhanced plasticity. All in all, neuroplasticity offers a slightly more reasonable explanation than extraterrestrials, right? So um, it makes sense that my kid between the ages of 13 and 21 was crazy, you know, it was just really difficult to deal with, into all kinds of trouble, and then all of a sudden, they transition fairly quickly into being responsible. That's amazing, it's a jump for joy. What happened during those years? What happened was this process, this final developmental process, delicate process, a process that was uh, a process that puts us at risk um, because of standard, typical teenage behavior. The kinds of changes discovered in the adolescent brain, roughly 12 to 18 years of age, show a loss of the overall number of neurons, which is in the gray matter, with an increase in the number of myelinated fibers, whose connecting functional neural networks. These changes represent a process of selection and reorganization of neural networks with a goal of faster and more efficient information processing. That's what we need, right? To, be, uh, to have a career and to be good at what we do, we have to be able to have very efficient information processing. Next slide. All right, here's just a quick look at the cortex. Um, and as I mentioned, you can see the frontal lobe there. It's very large um, and uh, tends to be very susceptible to traumatic brain injury. It just so happens that alcohol has a has an affinity for the frontal lobe and the cerebellum. So when people drink alcohol, the behavior that you see, the obnoxious behavior that you see, is really caused by a suppression of frontal lobe functioning. As people become more impulsive, they don't screen their emotions very well, they have extreme thoughts and ideas, uh, behave silly, all of that, all of that is, is, is caused by diminished frontal lobe function. And then they stagger and then and they have trouble with vision and all that. And that's from the, the changes that are occurring in the cerebellum at the time of intoxication. Obviously, these, are, these kind of things are temporary until the alcohol wears off. But when you keep doing it over and over and over and over again for 20 years or 30 years, obviously there will be some um, 
there'll be there'll be some residual impairment that will not return to normal. Okay, next slide, please. So the occipital lobe, and I, I'm just I don't mean to bore you with neuroanatomy. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go very quickly on this slide. So occipital lobe is primarily, and these are primary functions. For, it's primarily there for vision. Everything we see, we see it because it's projected to the occipital lobe from the eyes. The temporal lobe is is for listening and hearing things, you know, receptive language, memory functions. The parietal lobe links uh, the senses with motor abilities and creates the experience of a sense of our body and space. Insula and cingulate, very important, these structures, integrate limbic processing and link it to cortical networks. Um, if you take a look at what goes on in a person with chronic pain, in terms of how the pain signal is dispersed in the brain, one of the areas the signal goes to is the insula. The insula seems to be a structure right below the frontal lobes that, that basically tells us how does this pain I'm feeling at the moment compare with the pain I usually feel, and how does it compare with other people's pain? Right. So. The insula lights up like crazy in people that have chronic pain because the insula is all the time trying to figure out whether or not the pain I'm having is the usual pain I have or should I do something different about it, right? So if you have chronic pain and your average pain level is a 6 out of 10, and then all of a sudden you get up one day and you're a 10 out of 10, now you've got to figure out, should I go to the hospital? Should I stay home and relax? What should I do? Make Take more medication? Well, what, what have you done before? And so on. All that comparative thinking is occurring in the insula. Interestingly, if you take a person who has significant depression, and you take a look at the insula, uh, how it's functioning, uh, looking at it through a functional MRI or a uh, PET scan, you'll find that the insula is doing the same thing. So what is depression? Depression is psychological pain. And when we talked about chronic pain, there's physical pain. But both forms of pain are processed through the same structure. Very interesting. Um, frontal lobes regulate motor behavior, language, executive functioning, abstract reasoning, and directed attention. Next slide. The parietal lobe includes the somatosensory cortex. How do you know if something is touching you on if you if you're blindfolded and somebody touches your left hand? How do you know that you're being touched, and how do you know what hand that is? And that's coming from the somatosensory cortex. Um, so we we experience these as sensations. We we have spatial orientation that's occurring in the parietal lobe. Where do I fit in space? How do I negotiate my ambulation as I'm walking through a building, how do I not bang into things? The parietal lobe is helping us do that. Spatial awareness of your limbs, you know where your limbs are. Um, and when people have disorders of the parietal lobe, they'll actually have difficulty knowing where, where their limbs are sometimes. Uh, or they'll be lying down and swear they're sitting down. Um, so they'll have these unusual spatial disorientation um, experiences. Next slide, please. The temporal lobe structure that is in heavily involved in um, auditory processing, but also perception of smell, taste, and hearing. Structures affecting memory, mood, and personality are, are in the temporal lobe. Wernicke's area in the dominant hemisphere, the left hemisphere, allows us to recognize and understand spoken words, formulate response and conveys to Broca's area, which is the frontal response area, to be executed. So there's a there's a almost like a trunk line that goes from the Wernicke's area all the way to the frontal lobe, uh, in which spoken language is, is being sent in order to get a response. Next slide. One of the primary functions of the frontal lobe is motor control. You know, people have disorders of the frontal frontal lobe, particularly the motor strip, obviously they'll have impairment. A patient has a stroke of the motor strip, they'll have uh, loss of function of the limb on the opposite side. Um, voluntary motor activities are controlled by frontal lobe, control of the skeletal muscles. Uh, think about the frontal lobe as your output center. Most neurons in the ventral horn of the spinal cord um, are projected down to, the, to those um, to those neurons, other coordinating 
Regions like the cerebellum and basal ganglia are also involved in uh, motor output. Next slide. Now, in addition to those motor uh, functions, the frontal lobe is involved along with the temporal lobe in the creation of memory. People's personalities are generally a function of how well their frontal lobes are working. So you, what you hear in the traumatic brain injury field quite often is that my son had a traumatic brain injury and he's a different person. Or my daughter or my wife had a traumatic brain injury and she's not the same person. Her personality has changed. That is a common phenomenon following traumatic brain injury. Um, now, there may certain characteristics that a person has are certainly still there, but oftentimes these characteristics are exaggerated. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a quick example of a, of a patient I saw for a traumatic brain injury. I saw him the day he came into the trauma center uh, with a gigantic uh, uh, fracture of his skull and um, subdural hematoma, uh, subarachnoid hematoma. He had bilateral subdurals. And um, I followed this case from the moment he came in to the trauma service and f probably for three, four more years, I continued to see the guy. And one of the things I kept hearing from his family was that he's not the same person. Now, what did he do for a living? He was a salesman and he loved his job and he was very good at it. So now uh, he's not working any longer. He can't work. He has very severe cognitive impairments. But the personality change that is, is witnessed is that he can't stop being a salesman, so he's constantly trying to sell people things. Uh, one day I came out of my office, and my car uh, had um, envelopes and, and um, announcements of sales uh, all plastered all over my car. Um, he's constantly... Uh, doing this, he would walk into a nightclub of all things, with a with a uh, cooler, and he would try to sell people candy bars. Um, this this personality is an exaggeration of the pre morbid personality. Frontal lobe is also responsible for planning and judgment. Um, obviously. Uh, Judgment's very important. We have to make decisions about things, and um, the frontal lobe very important. Executive function is like this whole concept of organizing and interacting with all the brain structures being directed by the by the frontal lobe. This concept of executive function. It's an overarching concept that includes um, personality, planning, judgment, impulse control. Um, and lots of other things. Um, let me give you a, an analogy as to what executive function is. If you decide that, um, let's say this is post-COVID, and you want to go to the symphony, but when you get there, uh, you find out that um, they're having some problems, so you go, you're allowed to go backstage and talk to some of the musicians. And as you talk to the musicians, you find out that they're all great. Right? You ask each musician to play you a tune, and they can play it. Anything you ask them to play, they're pretty good. And they're ready to play a certain piece of music uh, that they're expecting uh, to play, but no one can seem to find the conductor. So where's the conductor? Well, nobody knows where he is. And it's time. The whole audience is there, and we're ready to hear this beautiful symphony. And one of the musicians gets up and says, look, we don't need the conductor. He doesn't even play an instrument. So we can play without him. And so they go ahead and they try to play without him. What happens? It doesn't sound right. It just doesn't sound right. It sounds like the symphony people were going to go see, but it just doesn't sound right because you don't have that conductor. That's your executive function. Your frontal lobe behaves like a conductor. It's conducting all of the functions, emphasizing some, de-emphasizing others, controlling impulses, all of that's going on uh, in the frontal lobe. And as I mentioned, the uh, motor cortex. Um, all right, next slide. Other functions, such as will, volition, choice, self-control, emotional content, very important 
especially in the early days of substance use treatment, uh, when a person's brain is still reacting to having that substance, um, emotional regulation sometimes is impaired. Right, the person has trouble regulating how they're going to respond to emotional issues. Uh, and what you find in people that have had frontal lobe injuries, for example, traumatic brain injuries, is that their responses to their own internal emotions tend to be exaggerated. And so they'll cry easily or they'll laugh for no reason. Uh, they, they just don't regulate their emotions very well. Um, people's moods um, are oftentimes... Uh, a the definition of whatever mood you're in oftentimes is related to how you're responding um, to emotional states that you're feeling, how you're responding to circumstances you're in. Um, and one of the big uh, important um, executive functions that we don't think much about but is very important is the concept of empathy and how, how did a traumatic brain injury or substance use disorder affect the person's ability to be accurately empathic. Very important to be able to, in, in the course of life, being able to be sensitive, be able to understand people's point of view, to be able to, um, uh, to, be, able to be helpful to other people and to get other people to be helpful to us. We have to have the ability to read people. We have to be able to read their emotions. And um, if you actually sit down and, and evaluate empathy and you find that a person's empathy skills are poor, uh, those are people that are going to have significant social difficulties. So we release them from treatment and we say, oh, you know, you're, you're, you've been sober now for a whole year and everything's great. Now you can go get an apartment and live by yourself. Um, that's a setup, you know, for, uh, for relapse because they really haven't figured out the higher functions. Empathy is like what we refer to perhaps as a metafunction or a metacognitive function in which you're sort of thinking about your thinking. So um, I don't think, you know, we've emphasized how to assess empathy very well. We don't, we don't assess it very well and we don't talk about it much. Uh, but uh, empathy happens to be a very important skill that we should be able to have as, as advanced organisms. We should be able to do that. Next slide, please. Frontal lobe obviously involved in thinking, reasoning, problem solving, memory, association, long-term potentiation, um, which is the creation of networks. Next slide. So what happens when you damage the prefrontal area? You, most of the time, when you damage the prefrontal cortex, you're going to have trouble with future planning, understanding the implications of your own behavior, initiating new actions, judgments are going to be off, how important are certain stimuli, how unimportant are certain stimuli, making decisions about where to put your focus may be off. You may have memory problems, not because you have a bad memory, but because you can't organize the material well enough to, to process it in a in a, uh, in a way that's um, efficient, um, which result in increased forgetfulness. How uh, damage to the frontal lobe, especially, for example, damage to the left frontal lobe, will often result in significant depression. Um, and then there are attention disorders. If you take a look at somebody that's had a traumatic brain injury, let's say mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, if you evaluate their attentional system, it looks very similar to what you see in a person that has attention deficit disorder. Very similar. Um, almost like you might call it an acquired attention deficit disorder. How does an attention deficit disorder, what difference does that make in a person who is in the midst of substance use treatment? What, how will that affect the treatment process? Um, and I think it affects the treatment process pretty significantly. Next slide. Sometimes damage uh, to the frontal lobes will cause muscle control problems. Uh, as you know, the left, for the most part, left brain controls right body, right brain controls left body. Um, and um, some people might have normal motor function, but abnormal 
sensory function. Uh, this depends on, on where the, if there's a brain lesion, where it's located. Next slide. All right, this slide, the purpose of this slide is just simply to look at the difference in how, how, thing, how uh, symptoms flow um, and assessments flow from a focal lesion versus a diffuse lesion. So basically, how does it lead to cognitive dysfunction? So a person has focal lesion, may have a brain contusion, uh, subdural hematoma, whatever. Um, then they would have secondary systemic complications, increased cranial pressure, hemorrhage, uh, decreased cerebral blood flow, leading to ischemia, which then causes secondary cellular injury mechanisms, which then uh, creates problems in, in the synapse. It could cause cell death, or it could cause axonal degeneration. Ultimately, what you get is cognitive dysfunction. All right, next slide. Now think about what it takes um, to stay sober. Let's say we let's say we you know we're about to evaluate and treat a person that has substance use disorder, and perhaps this person may have had a history of some concussions or a brain injury. And, and what ultimately what this person's done is this person has become aware that their use of substances is somehow having a negative impact on the quality of their life such that they need this treatment. They come to you for counseling and treatment. What does it take to stay sober? Right. If I say, I, you know, I don't want to do this, um, it's, a, it's a similar, like, what does it take to set a goal and stick to it? You know, it takes a lot of frontal lobe function. Right? You have to self-monitor. You have to have good self-guidance. You have to use your, your knowledge level your intellect, to guide your behavior. You have to control your impulses. You have to learn from negative feedback. You have to be able to reflect and have empathy. So there's a lot going on when you ask someone, and you say to someone, do you believe that you need to get sober? And the person says, yes, that's why I'm here. Oh, okay, we're all set then, right? Far from it, right? That person has to be able to get through all of these cognitive processes over some period of time to have any confidence at all that they can actually stay sober. Not easy. And some of the cognitive impairments that I've seen over the years in people that have um, had histories of substance use disorder, um, interestingly, follow right along with people who have had traumatic brain injuries who have no substance use disorder. They're very, there's a parallel uh, information processing and attention impairment is common, especially in the early days after detox. Unawareness of deficits. Now, what are we going to call this? Unawareness of deficits. Is that denial? Anosognosia is the neurological term for a person who has a lack of awareness of their own deficits. This occurs mostly in patients with right hemisphere brain lesions, but you can see this in people with bifrontal lobe in injuries as well. What's the difference between anosognosia and denial as we're taught um, regarding people with substance use? And uh, it's, a, it's an issue of, of debate. Um, I do think that people can have a psychological denial. That is, they, they don't deny that they have a substance use disorder. They, defy, they deny the imp implications of the substance use disorder. I can control it. I'm fine. Right? That's, a, that's a form of denial, even though they may admit that they have the problem. And also, uh, what we see in people after detox will be memory impairment. We sometimes, especially in uh, heavy drinkers, visuospatial deficits. I remember many years ago, I was a consultant to one of those fancy um, alcohol treatment facilities. And um, they asked me to um, come in and sort of audit their clinical program, which I did. And uh, one of the one of the activities they had an activity schedule. One of the activities was to, they had a sort of like a garage or barn, or whatever, where they would 
make things, and they were making birdhouses. And, um, geez, these are the most crooked birdhouses I've ever seen. The birdhouses were, you know, many of these guys, the guys who were not trained carpenters, they were never had any history of being able to do that, were trying to learn how to make simplified birdhouses, and they were all coming out crooked. And when you really take a look at it, there are three cognitive deficits you expect from, from heavy drinking. One is visual-spatial deficits, so it makes sense that you would have um, crooked birdhouses, uh, as well as learning difficulty or memory impairment and reasoning impairment. Those are the big three. Those are the three impairments you expect with alcohol, usually about two decades of heavy drinking. Uh, executive functioning deficits um, are also common in uh, patients who are, who are going through um, have gone through detox and are continuing. They're also extremely common in head injury as well. Intellectual difficulty is uncommon. Uh, typically, most people that have intellectual difficulty have extremely diffuse brain lesions. That is, they have a very big brain lesion. And they may, when you test them intellectually, you may find that they've had intellectual decline. People, obviously, who have forms of dementia uh, so, for example, uh, alcoholic dementia will have uh, a decline in intellectual functioning. Information processing measures are designed to determine the speed and accuracy of sensory perception and perceptual motor responses. These procedures are mediated by diverse brain structures that include multiple cortical regions, subcortical nuclei, and white matter connections. Information processing is affected in several ways. One example, similar to ADHD, those with mild TBI were impaired on reaction time. However, more worse than ADHD on reaction time tasks that require just making choices. So you can measure reaction time by itself, or you can measure reaction time as it relates to um, another operation of processing at the same time. When I test processing speed, I do it in two ways. I start off with a with a simple processing speed task where there's very little processing requirement. It's simply a speed task. So I look at basic speed, and then I do speed with differing levels of, of, um, of, um, of challenge um, in terms of processing itself. So sometimes you'll see a person will have a normal score on processing speed even with a challenge, but then if you add more challenge, then the speed slows way down. What's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is when we have processing speed impairment, it has an impact on other cognitive functions. It has an impact on our ability to process new information. And obviously, if a person is entering treatment, they're going to be getting a lot of new information. So we need to, it's, it's helpful if we can, if, if they have a problem in that area that we can identify it. Next slide. So the concept of anosognosia, which I mentioned earlier, is common. It's a common behavioral disorder occurring, occurring in people with TBI, the symptoms of which the patient is unaware may vary and include memory and cognitive deficits, I mean paresis, visual and other sensory disturbances, gait disorder and deficits, and natural, naturalistic action limit praxia. Patient's inability to recognize functionally relevant problems is known to be a major barrier to rehabilitation. Denial of neurological impairment can take several forms, including lack of emotional concern for acknowledged deficits, verbal denial of deficits that are implicitly acknowledged. Someone claims that they can walk, but obviously uh, they never attempt to do it. Um, a combination of explicit and implicit acknowledgement. So, you know, a person who's had a brain injury, say, 23, 24 years old, during the rehabilitation process, announces that they're going to be applying for medical school, yet, you know, the cognitive system is quite impaired. That's a person who is not aware of the limitations, right? and they, they need to have some level of awareness. not easy to get them there. Next slide. So subjective complaints of memory impairment are pretty common after TBI, and even among those people with mild TBI, now I will, I will say to you that mild TBI memory complaints, when you really boil it down, are actually complaints of increased forgetfulness, which is not memory. It's primarily attention and concentration. 
there's a reliable correlation uh, between memory performance and, and brain volumetric pre uh, measures in the temporal lobe of adults with mild TBI. So if you have cell loss in the temporal lobe, you'll have memory problems. Specifically, decreased hippocampal and temporal white matter volumes were significantly related to memory impairment. When, uh, in people who are heavy drinkers, say 30 years of heavy drinking, they tend to have cell volume loss uh, in these medial temporal lobe area, which is close to the hippocampus um, and close to the thalamus, actually. Functional imaging suggests brain activity patterns of people with TBI become altered during tasks of memory retrieval. Now, what are some of the complications um, of a person who, who uh, has TBI may be coming in for substance use treatment? Uh, Post-traumatic seizures are fairly common. Sometimes there's impairment in coordinated movement, balance and dizziness problems, visual processing difficulty, fatigue, sleep difficulty. Sleep disturbance is extremely common in substance use cases, but also common in mild traumatic brain injury as well. Okay, estimates indicate that 18.9 million adults in the U.S. were diagnosed with substance use disorder with dependence in 2011, approximately 8% of the adult population. Uh, approximately 23.5 million Americans aged 12 and older required intervention for substance use. It's projected that disability caused by substance use disorders will surpass that caused by any other, and it, it pretty much has. So addiction appears to represent anomalies of four areas of the addiction pathway. The survival reinforcement circuit involving an overactive go switch in the old brain, a damaged underactive stop switch in the control circuit of the new brain. Impaired communication between these two key circuits leads to addiction. Damaged, stay-stopped brain areas that make recovery extremely difficult for some add addicts. So where is the stay-stopped location? The frontal lobe. Where does traumatic brain injury typically manifest itself? The frontal lobe. If a person that's had a traumatic brain injury starts using drugs and alcohol, which they do about two years post-injury. They start to use drugs and alcohol, um, over 50%. Um, getting them to stop will not be easy because the, 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 um, the structure that they need uh, to allow them to stop has been damaged. So the reward system is basically the addiction circuit. Um, and the, when we activate the reward system, we feel reward, we feel comfort, we feel pleasure from ordinary activities. And of, oftentimes, um, most of us who are not abusing, using substances or have a brain injury, most of us uh, stimulate the reward system regularly because that's how we get motivated. That's how we realize something was fun and enjoyable. But genetics uh, and environmental uh, stimuli can affect uh, how this cascade of neurochemistry works. And unfortunately, some of our genes come with variations. These variations are called polymorphisms. Polymorphisms change the way the gene expresses itself. Most people will call this a predisposition. So you don't hear people say, well, he was predisposed to becoming addicted to alcohol or predisposed to becoming addicted to uh, cocaine or heroin or whatever the case may be. What they're really saying is that the genetic makeup of that individual is such that certain genes um, are, in, are defective, leading to uh, a desire for a particular substance. Next slide. So here, here are these two very important neurochemical pathways. If you look at this slide, you see the VTA, which is the ventral tegmental area. That's right at the top of the brain stem. And then um, you have those yellow arrows are pointing to what's called the striatum. Very important structure that is transmitting emotional information. And then you see um, there's a yellow arrow to the left, right in the middle of the brain there. It's pointing to the nucleus accumbens. Very critical structure. 
in the reward pathway. That's where we feel pleasure. And then you have your prefrontal cortex. So the main neurotransmitter that controls all of this is dopamine. Dopamine is, is the neurotransmitter that's affected primarily by substances of abuse. Thing, any, any substance that somebody uses or abuses or just uses is affecting the dopaminergic pathway. A long parallel to that pathway is the serotonergic pathway. And serotonin levels have an have impact on things like mood, memory processing, memory processing, sleep, and cognition. You see uh, the red dot um, called the Rafe nucleus. That's very close to what's called the reticular activating system, which is the part of your brain that tells you when to wake up and when to go to sleep. So it's not surprising that people that have traumatic brain injury, as well as people that have had addiction, will have sleep-wake problems because that area of the brain has been uh, impacted by their history, by what, what's going on. Additionally, if they have genetic problems related to these, ne these neurochemical uh, uh, pathways, uh, then uh, that will also result in sleep-wake problems. So when people take cocaine, for example, cocaine turns into dopamine and overstimulates the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens. And also um, gets into the striatum and suppresses the frontal lobe's ability to act. Uh, that is, stop doing it. So um, what ends up happening is the person gets into a vicious cycle of overuse. Now, one of the things, one of the ironies in all of this is that as we as we take in substances that affect our consciousness, affect our mental state, um, our brain wants to be efficient. So the brain will say, "Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna take in all this extra dopamine, then I don't have to make so much dopamine, right?" So the brain will actually slow down its dopaminergic manufacture, and when you decide to stop uh, taking the drug, in this case, cocaine. What is one of the major symptoms of stopping is major depression, severe major depression, because dopamine is necessary. Dopamine is necessary not to be depressed. So, so all the all this chemical process is, is very much uh, implied in the uh, acquisition of addiction. So in the human uh, genome, there's 3 billion bases or nucleotides. In humans, there are estimated to be 30,000 genes. Each gene is a sequence of bases or nucleotides. Next slide. So a single nucleotide polymorphism in genes um, is where a, a base or where any, any nucleotide that's part of a pair is the wrong nucleotide. Basically, it's a... It's an error. And so whenever um, a person has greater than 5% errors in a gene, that gene will not express itself properly. So there is a theory uh, uh, called reward deficiency syndrome. There's a theory behind that which basically says that greater than 5% of your dopaminergic genes are impaired, they don't work right, and therefore... You either don't metabolize uh, dopamine properly, that is, you metabolize it too quickly, uh, or you manufacture, you don't manufacture enough uh, dopamine. Um, and what is the result, what is the behavioral effect of, of lowering your dopamine level? The behavioral effect is to feel low, feel depressed, feel without joy, you don't feel joyful much. Um, and the only thing that seems to get your dopamine levels up is to do something highly risky or to feed yourself uh, substances that will increase dopamine level. So if you happen to be an individual whose genetic makeup is such that your dopamine genes aren't working properly, you may discover that taking cocaine or 
any substance that alters your consciousness will result in an increase in dopamine level, and therefore you're highly likely to continue to use the substance. So all roads lead to dopamine. Um, we do things on a compulsive basis because our dopamine levels are going up when we do them. So dopamine is used to signal novel and motivationally relevant environmental events. And dopamine is also important for the motivation and reinforcement of action. Drugs that interfere with dopamine transmission interfere with reinforcement learning, while manipulations that enhance dopamine transmission, such as brain stimulation and addictive drugs, often act as reinforcers. Dopamine transmission is crucial for creating a state of motivation to seek rewards. So let's get back to these go and stop switches, because it's related, believe it or not, to what I'm saying. The area of the brain that encourages a human or any mammal to perform an, or repeat an action that promotes survival is called a survival reinforcement circuit. Its normal function is to reinforce an action that promotes survival, for example, eating, drinking, sexual behavior. It is also part of the brain most affected by psychoactive drugs. Technically, this circuit is referred to as the mesolimbic dopaminergic reward pathway, which is located in the old brain. When I say old brain, it's the part of the brain that uh, is pr primarily survival-oriented. This survival reinforcement circuit located in the old, bra old brain acts as a ghost switch or a Morse switch. At the heart of the circuit is the nucleus accumbens, which we, which we sh showed you earlier. The ventral tegmental area, the lateral hypothalamus, the amygdala also play important roles. The control, the control circuit, located mostly in the new brain, acts as a stop switch and is driven by the left orbital prefrontal cortex. The stop switch works in conjunction with, with a fasciculus. A fasciculus is like a trunk line, as I mentioned earlier. A fasciculus retroflexus and the lateral uh, habanula, which connect and communicate from stop switch to the go switch. So you, ha you have these lines of communication, direct lines of communication through these various fasciculi. So the prefrontal cortical areas work in tandem with the striatal regions via corticostriatal networks that are modulated by dopamine. These include the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved in higher cog cognitive operations, and decision-making, the orbital frontal cortex, which is involved in salience attribution, what's important, what's not important, and goal-directed behaviors. And the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in the inhibitory control and awareness in addicted subjects, which probably underlies the enhanced incentive motivational value of drugs and the user's loss of control over drug intake. Now, this is a big circuit that sits in your brain. Next slide, please. Now, when people use psychoactive drugs, memories of the experience are imprinted on the brain. Where they got the drug, the reason they used it, what feelings they were having. The stronger the drug, the more rapid the growth and proliferation of memory footprints. These dendritic spines um, around the uh, cell body of the neuron. And therefore, the more deeply imprinted the memory. The earlier in life a person begins using drugs or practices addictive behaviors, the longer and stronger the memories remain in the brain, and the more likely the brain is to use information from those memories to deal with events later in life. Very important reason why you always want to know when did the person start using drugs and alcohol. They started at 8 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old. Very important. People that start using drugs and alcohol at an older age, 25, 30 years old, are much easier to treat because the memories they have are not as deep-seated memory. They're not they're, they're memories that, that can um, that can be um, altered and changed. So um, earlier people that start using drugs at an earlier age have numerous memories surrounding those, and every time they're reminded, um, then they will have an urge to use. So the old brain consists of the brainstem, cerebellum, mesocortex, which contain the limbic system. That's the emotional part of your brain. It's not rational. Regulating physiological functions of the body, we mentioned that before, experiencing basic emotions and cravings, anger, fear, hunger, thirst, lust, pain, and pleasure, imprinting survival memories. That green plant tastes good. This bad color signifies danger. So we pick this stuff up as we're developing. 
It's interesting. M- most living things, most animals, for example, will not drink alcohol. You have to t- trick them into drinking it. We drink alcohol, though. Human, we supposedly have a higher level of brain function, but we drink alcohol even though it's toxic. So, all right. Next story. The old brain responds to internal changes in memories as well as to sensory inputs from external influences. When a person uses a psychoactive drug, most often it is the old brain that remembers the experience and how it felt. Right, so we, we talk a lot about stimulus control, right? When we're working with a person that has an addiction problem, we want them to stay away from um, friends that were partners in their substance use. We want, to, we want them to stay away from neighborhoods and areas where they tended to use substances. Why? Because those memories are very strong, and they create significant uh, craving uh, when, those act, when they're activated. Next slide. The old brain is the senior partner, and the new brain is the young upstart. Whenever the two brains are challenged by a crisis, such as fear or anger, there is an automatic tendency to revert to the more established old brain function. And because the craving to use psychoactive drug almost always resides in the old brain, the desire for the pleasure, pain relief, and excitement that drugs promise can be very powerful. The new brain, the neocortex, processes information from the old brain, from different, as well as different areas of the new brain, and from the senses via the peripheral nervous system. The new brain allows us to speak, reason, create, remember, make decisions, and then act. The old brain simply reacts. Craving can override the new brain's rational arguments. Too expensive, bad consequences. There's a midterm tomorrow, so don't party tonight. Those are natural. Those are rational arguments not to use, but the, but craving can override that. The old brain acts four or five times more rapidly than the new brain, so an action is usually well underway before common sense kicks in. You know, you have the situation. All of a sudden, you find yourself doing something particularly ridiculous, and you say, "Why am I doing this?" And it's, it takes a while for the old, for the new brain to catch on that what you're doing makes no sense. During intentional abstinence from a drug craving, from drug, from a drug, cravings are evoked by memory and emotions. And a virtual tug of war between the old brain and the new brain occurs. There is a conscious desire to remain drug free, but the old brain seeks to resume drug use, mistaking the craving as a survival need. So, if you have a person that um, has had addiction to an opiate tends to use opiates. Opiates um, have this um, issue of creating withdrawal symptoms that are pretty significant. And the old brain interprets withdrawal symptoms as a threat, and interprets withdrawal symptoms as a possibility of dying. And you will often hear people who are coming off of opiates say that they feel like they're dying. And, and that feeling um, is actually coming from this old brain trying to override the new brain, which is telling you to stay off the drug. Okay. So as humans develop, they continue to learn to integrate the drives of the old brain and the common sense of the new brain. Some people, however, lose some of this ability due to the genetic learning abnormalities, a chaotic or abusive childhood, the presence of traumatic brain injury, the use of psychoactive drugs, and the practice of compulsive behaviors. Psychoactive drugs subvert the survival mechanism from common sense integration of the new and old brains, resulting in the irrational behavior of addiction, which which relies on the wants of the old brain rather than the rational needs of the new brain. Say a few words about the orbital frontal cortex, particularly important structure in this dance between the old and the new brain. Um, So the orbital frontal cortex has been shown to participate in outcomes related to primary reinforcers in both non-human and human studies. These neurons encode details concerning the sensory properties of rewards, such as visual, olfactory, and gustatory aspects, and the size, the timing of past or future rewards, as well as the magnitude of more abstract rewards and penalties. The orbital frontal lobe plays a very important role. Next slide. Impairments of the orbital frontal lobe uh, cortex and the anterior cingulate are associated with compulsive behaviors and impulsivity. And it has also been postulated that impaired modulation of these regions by dopamine might underlie the compulsive and impulsive aspects of drug taking and abuse. Impaired self-control plays a fundamental role in drug taking behaviors and addiction. 
Successful self-regulation functions require top-down control of the prefrontal cortex to the striatal and limbic regions involved in the rewards and emotions. So when you're working with a client as a, as a counselor, what you're trying to teach the client is top-down thinking, not bottom-up thinking, which is typically how they think now. Next slide. So impaired self-control in addicted people is believed to reflect disrupted prefrontal regulation of striatal regions. The level of impairment is influenced by the emotional state. Negative mood increases impairment, and the context exposure to unexpected cues can also impair it as well. You know, sitting in a social event, uh, you're being more cautious not to use and all of a sudden the hostess comes out and serves everyone a glass of alcohol. That is an emotional, that is a situation in which the context um, pushes you into using the, the substance um, based upon poor orbital frontal control. Uh, damage to the orbital frontal cortex also interferes with the inhibition of responding to formally rewarding cues that are no longer reinforcing, thus favoring the emergence of preservative behaviors even when these are no longer reinforcing. Ultimately, uh, as all of you know, we, as, as addiction becomes more severe, the repertoire of behaviors available to us diminishes so that ultimately you're left with one set of behaviors, and that is the seeking of drugs. Um, and all other all other behaviors are very rarely referred to, and and they're only used when uh, when it's a way of getting drugs. So um, the orbital frontal cortex and the anterior ciglia, it's all about self regulation. Impaired self control in addicted people is believed to reflect disruption of this of this circuit. Damage to the orbital frontal lobe, which occurs in traumatic brain injury, also interferes with the inhibition of responding to formally rewarding cues that are no longer reinforcing, thus favoring the emergence of preservative behaviors even when these are no longer reinforcing. Thus, dysregulated activity of the orbital frontal cortex could underlie both the impulsive choices for immediate rewards and compulsive drug taking when the drug-induced dopamine increases may be profoundly attenuated in addicted people. This loss of control might continue even when drug taking has become less rewarding or when adverse consequences far outweigh psychological and physiological benefits. Don't you, you always have that question in your head? Why are you doing this, right? Well, we, this is a person who has nothing but trauma in their life, one trauma after the next, all from their drug use, but they keep doing it. Why are you doing it? it they're doing it because this circuit is, is, no, is not working the way it's supposed to work. They need time away from the drug. They need time for their brain to recalibrate um, itself chemically, and they need to learn how to do top-down thinking. Substance use and traumatic brain injury, some of the research findings, the history of traumatic brain injury is frequent among individuals receiving treatment for alcohol or substance use disorders. The relationship between alcohol abuse and TBI is complex and probably circular. Adolescents who drink regularly were twice as likely, likely to sustain a TBI compared with adolescents who have never used alcohol. Initial alcohol-related TBI um, TBI sustained after 12 were associated with a fourfold increased risk uh, of repeat TBI at the, by the age of 34. There's, a strong evidence, there's strong evidence that uh, intoxication at the time of injury is related to acute complications, longer hospital stays, and poor discharge status. Alcohol misuse prior to TBI has consistently been found to mediate outcome from TBI. So people who have uh, significant uh, alcohol misuse prior to the TBI will have a tendency to have a much longer um, rehabilitation course. The history of substance misuse is related to a wide range of outcomes, including higher mortality rates, poorer neuropsychological functioning, increased chance of repeated injury, late deterioration, and worse functioning, worse functional outcome. Next slide. Intoxication and a history of premorbid alcohol use are related to worsening injury severity indicators and early medical outcomes. Patients with positive blood alcohol levels on hospital admission have lower levels of consciousness when admitted, longer duration of coma, and longer lengths of hospitalization. Post-traumatic amnesia and loss of consciousness were significantly longer in groups of patients with pre-injury alcohol abuse.
Pre-injury history of alcohol misuse also appears to exacerbate the effects of TBI on brain structure and function. TBI patients with a history of alcohol abuse demonstrated greater volumes of intracranial hemorrhage. And TBI patients with a history of alcohol abuse also have a more pronounced local brain atrophy over, over time compared to non-drinkers. TBI sustained in people with a history of alcohol intoxication at the time of the injury demonstrated worse cognitive outcomes than those with negative toxicology screens, with particular difficulty on tests of verbal intelligence, verbal memory, attention, and concentration. Harmful or hazardous alcohol use in the 12 months prior to TBI was associated with poor verbal learning and memory and slowed processing speed. Previous alcohol misuse increases the risk for development of mood disorders following TBI. Substance use or substance use disorder may complicate issues of TBI recovery. People who are recovering from TBI have lowered seizure thresholds, and then using substances may lower those thresholds even more. The use of substances during TBI rehabilitation increases the risk for another TBI. Uh, let me give you a quick case example. I had a, a gentleman who was about 30 years old who had a pretty significant traumatic brain injury, was uh, hospitalized uh, in a rehabilitation hospital for a couple months, then released home. Uh, then he came into my program. I was running an outpatient um, day program for traumatic brain injury survivors, and um, he responded quite well to rehabilitation. And what we were trying to do with him is to make better judgments. He had a lot of frontal lobe-type injury and behaviors. And so we did a lot of uh, teaching of compensatory strategies, and um, he was doing well, and then uh, he decided that he was going to have a few drinks one afternoon, and he had a few drinks, and he, he could not make an accurate judgment of, ob of the relationship of objects in space. He had visual perceptual deficits caused by, caused by his brain injury, but also caused by his drinking. And uh, so he misjudged the distance between himself and a bus and, uh, and was killed, uh, was run over uh, because the probability that he was going to use compensatory strategies while he was under the influence of alcohol was pretty low, uh, not to mention the fact that it probably was impaired, more impaired at that time than he would have been had he not been drinking. Um, the use of substances during TBI recovery um, may actually contribute to greater brain damage. After traumatic brain injury, alcohol and other drugs may have a more powerful effect. So maybe uh, prior to brain injury, you could drink three drinks and be okay, but uh, now you, one or two drinks, you may feel intoxicated. Um, the following TBI-related symptoms may hinder treatment for substance use disorder. Cognitive limitations. If a person has cognitive limitations, I mean, what is the what is the vehicle upon which you're helping a person get sober. The vehicle is talking, right? It's cognitive processing. Um, it's the it's processing of information with a, with a goal in mind of this person changing their circuitry, creating new circuitry that's oriented around survival in a logical way. It's organized around it's organized around long term improvement in the quality of their life. That requires a lot of cognitive function, as we discussed earlier when we talked about the cognitive demands of sobriety. Um, increased irritability or emotional stress are common um, in people that have TBI, and um, this is sometimes misinterpreted in substance use facilities as either resistance or um, a lack of motivation. Problems with inhibition, difficulty inhibiting responses, um, and treatment of pain uh, with medications um, may hinder treatment for substance use disorder. About 50% of patients that have had traumatic brain injury will have ongoing pain. Um, a, a large number will have headache pain, but there's a whole group that have um, back pain um, and neck pain. Um, and oftentimes, uh, their uh, physicians, their primary care physicians or their rehab physicians, uh, hear their complaints about pain and offer them uh, usually um, you know, analgesic uh, um, opioid pain relievers, basically, and um, it's not, not, e not hard for them to overuse these, these medications. Substance use disorder and TBI implications for TBI recovery. Negative consequences of ongoing substance use following TBI include interference with the natural healing process of the brain. So everybody who has a traumatic brain injury has a recovery curve, 
that recovery curve is interfered with uh, when you bring uh, substances on board, particularly alcohol. Increased risk for seizures. Um, um, this is a controversial topic because there is a certain aspect of drinking alcohol that actually lowers your risk for seizures, but it's, it, it, that occurs when you reach a steady state of alcohol. So as you are increasing your blood alcohol level, your seizure threshold drops, and then when you reach a steady state, then it goes back to normal. And then when you get off the alcohol, it, the seizure threshold changes again. Uh, so most people will have seizures as they're getting off of uh, the alcohol. I had a traumatic brain injury patient um, who was in my, uh, had a frontal lobe um, group. These are all patients with pretty significant frontal lobe injuries. And um, this is a patient who um, was drinking heavily and uh, was beaten up, terribly beaten, and left for dead under a truck and um, was found the next day, was brought into the emergency room, was evaluated and admitted. Um stayed in the acute care facility for about two weeks and then was transferred to rehab. Um, and then he stayed in rehab for about a month and then he was released home and he, came, and he was referred to my group and came into my group. And the group was very focused on um, trying to adjust to cognitive difficulties that they were all having. And, and part of that discussion about adjustment was was being realistic about use of substances, particularly alcohol, and how it was dangerous, you know. So after maybe four or five weeks in the group, his name was Jimmy, and Jimmy said, uh, well, I just went to my neurologist, and my neurologist said, I'm 99% back to normal. So given that, uh, next Friday, well, I'm going to return to drinking because I'm back to normal. And that's what I did every Friday when I was normal. So uh, Jimmy had a drinking habit of drinking heavily on Fridays and occasionally on Saturdays, but mostly Fridays, only one time a week. Um, and so, of course, the group was horrified, and we basically said, no, Jimmy, you, you really shouldn't return uh, to drinking on Fridays. But his goal was to drink uh, Fridays. And he says, well, I'm going to gradually re-expose myself to alcohol, so I'm going to drink just two or three this Friday, and then if I get away with that pretty good, then the following Friday I'll just let it all happen, you know. So, so um, he went uh, out that Friday and did drink his three drinks, and and he stopped, which was amazing that he stopped. And then um, he came back to group and he told everyone that he was successful in his goal to have more drinking, and um, people were still horrified, obviously, and still trying to convince him to stop doing this. And then he, he said, oh, no, no, uh, you know, I'm going to be going out Friday. So he, he went to his favorite watering hole on Friday, and then um, I got a um, call from the emergency department, um, and uh, he was in the emergency department uh, the next morning with a, with a grandma seizure. So I talked with him for a few minutes and said, uh, you know, this is what happens, you know, when you drink alcohol after we've had a brain injury. And he said, no, that's not the reason I had a seizure. I had a seizure because my dilantin isn't working that well. So I'm just going to increase my dilantin. So obviously he missed the whole point. And then the following week, uh, he drank successfully. And then a couple of weeks went by. And then uh, he drank at a family outing on a Sunday. And I got a call from Rhode Island Hospital again and that he was back in the hospital with another seizure. And at that time, um, he explained to me that uh, he realized that it probably wasn't the dilantin that was the problem, and that he would start to consider slowing his drinking down or eliminating his drinking. So he did very well after that, I should say. Uh, but that's a good example of how, how drinking or drug use can, uh, can have an impact on a person uh, that has had a TBI. Exacerbations of TBI-related physical and psychological symptoms, such as um, balance difficulties and depression, um, uh, are uh, common when people are using substances uh, during rehab. Magnifications of TBI-related cognitive difficulties, bad judgment, decision-making, all of that is affected. So it's already affected by the TBI, and now you're adding a substance that worsens it. Next slide. Negative consequences. Uh, uh, continued heightened risk for suicide attempts, particularly when depressed, is also a, an issue. 
with people who have TBI and are using substances, increased risk for legal difficulties, criminal misconduct, difficulties distinguishing whether cognitive difficulties, for example, problems with memory, are due to TBI or substance use, and increased risk for future TBIs. Substance use disorder and TBI risk factors have continued. Um, so pre-TBI substance abuse is a risk factor. Uh, Post-TBI depression. So if I had pre-TBI substance abuse, I'm probably going to have post-TBI substance abuse. Post-TBI, if I was a substance abuser before, I'm going to have depression. I may have more depression after TBI. If you're a male, you have a higher probability of having um, substance use disorder after TBI. If you're younger, you have a higher probability. Single, you have a higher probability. And if you're on Medicaid or no health insurance at all, another high, higher probability. This is, these are just um, you know, demographic statistics that were, that were described in certain um, research articles. Next slide. All right. I want to talk just for a few minutes about, so we've been talking about a lot of technical stuff um, and um, sort of evolving to a point where uh, I want to talk a little bit about how do we take care of people that have this combined problem and uh, it's a rather um, complicated issue because it requires funding, it requires integrated services. And so the, a model was developed uh, by John Corrigan at Ohio State University uh, through the Model Systems Program. And in that, in that model, he, he determined that you know, the best way to, to deal with uh, patients like this, complex cases, is you have to have a collaborative relationship between substance use professionals and TBI professionals. There needs to be training like this. There needs to be coordinated efforts. And who you lean on the most depends upon severity factors. So if you have a person with a heavy-duty, high-severity substance use disorder and a low-severity uh, brain injury disorder, um, you're going to have a collaboration in the substance use disorder system. Uh, you're going to you're going to help out. If you're a TBI professional, you're going to give information to the substance use people as to what to look for. Um, if it's the other way around, if the person has high severity TBI, there's also a collaboration. This time, the substance use people will be uh, collaborating with you. Um, same thing, quadrant one, which would be a person that has low severity for both. This is usually easy to deal with. And then quadrant four is integrated treatment uh, in the community with integrated programs where there are programs that are specifically designed for this particular population. So in order to deal with this population efficiently, there has to be a great deal of collaboration, and the collaboration needs to occur uh, with between substance use professionals and also, um, also professionals in the TBI field. So um, when... Uh, we're assessing a patient that's had a TBI and is also using substances. We, we, we need to have um, a good history of what their medical illnesses are. Um, we have to have um, understand medical, the implications of medical illnesses on behavior, thyroid disease, for example. Um, current medical status, uh, is the person healthy, not healthy? What are the implications of whatever, I'd say, for example, high blood pressure, or uh, other systemic types of illnesses that may be occurring. Uh, when was the most recent medical examination? And if it's if it's within uh, the, the last two or three weeks or month, that's you can rely on that. But but if it hasn't been for a few months, then they need to get another medical evaluation as they enter treatment. What are the current medications and, impl and implications for behavior and cognitive functioning? Sometimes, a good example, I just had a patient. Um, a patient uh, uh, had a mild head injury and developed uh, severe headaches uh, for a while. And the um, patient was treated with medication for those headaches. Uh, and the patient was suspended from their job because they were having um, trouble keeping up with what was going on. They were losing documents, forgetting to go to meetings, things like that. So the supervisor t took her aside and said, you know, you, 
you really need to get your act together. Something's going on. I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to suspend you for a couple of weeks and see what you can do to fix this. So um, it turns out that um, her neurologist, who she saw for her headaches, uh, put her on a medication that he thought would be helpful for her headaches, such as Topamax. Now, some of the major side effects of Topamax are cognitive decline. Uh, so what was happening is while she was on Topamax to reduce her headaches, it was also reducing her her cognitive abilities. As a result, uh, she almost lost her job. So understanding the implications of medications on behavior uh, and cognitive function are very important uh, when, when uh, we're assessing a new patient. Mental status examination. This is uh, very important and oftentimes neglected. So we certainly, almost everyone does a mental status examination in the sense that we get a history and we, we ask patients important questions about sleep and appetite and those kinds of things. But there's a cognitive component to mental status examination that's often um, skipped uh, and uh, uh, not, not done. And um, uh, on the initial interview uh, or on the second interview, a cognitively based mental status examination should be done. Um, what is the patient's history of psychiatric illness if they have such a history? Um, and what medications have they been on in the past for psychiatric um, illness? <clears throat> and then the issue of psychological testing. Um, there's two types of tests that we use, um, that I use, state tests. And basically, these are tests that measure the emotional state of the patient at the time they fill the form out. And then trait tests, what are the consistent common characteristics of this individual that are present all the time? Um, what is the impact of psychological status on motivation? Uh, implications of a history of such psychiatric illnesses as recurrent depression, bipolar disorder, psychotic episodes, post-traumatic stress disorder. I think that in patients who have histories of, of addiction, who then get a traumatic brain injury, and then are having trouble recovering from that brain injury without using substances, those people more than likely have post-traumatic stress. There's some sort of stressor um, in their history, and, and that should look, be looked at very closely. I think many, many people who struggle with addiction have histories of trauma. <clears throat> then, obviously, the, the, com the next component of the assessment would be taking a look at substance use itself. History taking, obviously, when did the person start using what, what drugs does the person prefer? And typically, um, you'll find that um, people tend to prefer drugs that, that help them compensate for other problems. So it's not uncommon for people that have pretty significant forms of ADHD to use cocaine. Because cocaine helps you pay attention. People that have... Um, Deficiency of dopamine levels, for example, will have a tendency to use opiates, um, um, and um, because opiates uh, increase levels of dopamine very quickly, and they may also use cocaine, but they don't sometimes don't like uh, the effects of the cocaine, the initial effects of the cocaine, so they'll, they they like more of a downer effect, so they'll usually typically use opiates. One of the questions I ask patients who are um, have used opiates in the past. If I'm trying looking for uh, those those dopamine gene polymorphisms, I will ask a patient, "When you have you ever taken an opiate?" And the patient says, "Yes, I have." Did the how did the opiate make you feel? And if if they tell me that the opiate energized them, then I suspect that they have a reduced level of dopamine in general because opiates really don't energize you. If if you don't have that problem. So um, opiates typically sedate you. So about one-third of the United States population has greater than 5% polymorphisms in the, in the dopaminergic system. So there's a lot of people that have deficiencies in dopamine. There's also a lot of people who are involved in substance use, um, and I think there's a reason. That's one of the reasons for that. Um, Understanding the implications of a very of specific drugs on brain function. So a person has a tendency to use certain drugs, for example, ecstasy. That patient, once once they've been drug free for a while, 
may may demonstrate some, some really interesting impairments of their memory system, and uh, and um, and will have a tendency to be very forgetful of any information that you're giving them that you're using as part of your treatment process. Implications of specific use patterns in reference to brain neurochemistry. Uh, understanding the circumstances of use. When does a person use? Why do they use then? And use of standardized measures as part of the assessment process. And there are a few standardized measures. I, a measure that I use a lot uh, is um, the alcohol expectancies questionnaire. So when I have patients who are coming in because of excessive alcohol use, I'd like to know what is it they expect alcohol to do for them. Um, and that particular questionnaire is nice because it has a group of um, variables that are related to positive effects of alcohol and also a couple of variables related to the negative expectancy. So if they expect alcohol to, make, to give them cognitive difficulties or, or to make them feel apathetic or careless, uh, then they typically um, are not going to continue using. However, most of the patients I see in the early days of treatment, of early phases of treatment, will have a significant positive uh, expectancies such as tension reduction or social enhancement. Assessment of cognitive stand. How do you do this? Uh, a significant number of people seeking treatment for substance use disorder have histories of head trauma from multiple concussions to severe TBI. Likewise, it's not uncommon for people being seen in TBI programs to have had histories of substance use. At the time of treatment initiation, the use of standardized cognitive screening tools can be applied, but the limits of those tools must be understood. In addition to the detection of cognitive impairment due to TBI, many people with substance use disorder have cognitive impairment due to the drugs that have been taken, and some have cognitive deficits due to, the, due to developmental problems, such as learning disability, ADHD, or toxic exposure. So, in the best of all worlds, and I know this is uh, pie in the sky thinking, but neuropsychological assessment should be played should be playing a very important role in the full assessment process. I know that that's probably not practical because neuropsychological assessments are expensive, and not everyone has the funding for that. But there are ways around that. Um, they're not perfect, but certainly uh, figuring you know identifying certain people on a like for example, in a substance use treatment facility, identifying one or two people who want to learn a lot about cognitive assessment and having them uh, be trained to do um, uh, cognitive assessments, um, it's not the same thing as a full neuropsychological, but it does give you good information. Uh, some of the things I, I expect to see when I evaluate these patients are attention impairments, Retrieval difficulty, memory impairment, executive function difficulty. Not really language impairments very much, but certainly word finding difficulty, which you might consider a language impairment, and visual perceptual impairment. Those are commonly seen. Next slide, please. Treatment planning, taking neuropsychological status into account when planning treatment. You know, as we mentioned, what are the cognitive demands of treatment? What's the cognitive demands that are going to be happening in this treatment program? Is this a is this a highly active residential treatment program where there's a big schedule to keep, uh, or is this a program outpatient program where the patient comes once or twice a week? Is it a group process? Those things are important to understand as they relate to the level of cognitive dysfunction that the patient may have. Cognitive demands of living sober um, are very important to take into account. Modifying standard treatment techniques when initiating treatment for substance use disorder. The next presentation I'll be making, I'll be talking extensively about treatment modifications. What do you do differently when you're treating a person for addiction or substance use dependency? What do you do uh, differently in the, in the application of whatever treatment model that you're using? Um, and then, then there's the issue of cognitive rehabilitation. Research was done in the early um, 90s. Research was done um, looking at what is the implications of cognitive rehab in a substance use treatment facility. And what they found was that patients who were identified as having cognitive difficulty and then offered cognitive rehabilitation, their rates of relapse were lower than patients who were not uh, exposed to the cognitive rehabilitation. So 
um, expect that uh, patients entering a treatment substance use um, treatment facility will have cognitive compromise. Expect that a certain percentage of those patients will have cognitive compromise from a history of concussion or mild traumatic brain injury or even moderate traumatic brain injury. Some will have cognitive decline be simply because of the way they've been treating themselves, undernourished, poor, um, poor health in general, and then, and then certainly the use of toxic substances. Uh, but ultimately, um, if you, if you f complete an evaluation on a client and you determine, regardless of whether it's from TBI or substance use, you determine that they have a compromise of their cognitive system, then it may be helpful to offer a person cognitive rehabilitation. Nowadays, cognitive rehabilitation can be done by one's own self. So um, there are numerous uh, cognitive rehabilitation programs that you can download onto a computer. Um, and then there are programs that are offered in a more standard sort of one-on-one -on -one basis with a, with a clinician.